The Dodgers are trying to build a dynasty. To the track, to the wall, Freeman second of the game. And it might work. And Shohei with a drive, right center field. That ball is long gone. On December 9th, Shohei Otani announced his decision to sign with the LA Dodgers, joining former MVPs Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman to create one of the most talented big threes in baseball history. But the Dodgers weren't done there. They went on to acquire two dominant starters, Tyler Glasnow and the most coveted player on the market after Otani, Yoshinobu Yamamoto. Keep in mind, this team won 100 games last year. Unsurprisingly, the Dodgers are the favorites to win the 2024 World Series. However, taking into account this team's historic new core and their prior decade of success, there's the real possibility this team ultimately becomes a dynasty. So, how are the Dodgers able to do all this? Well, to fully understand how, we need to go back to a time when the Dodgers were at their lowest. The Diamondbacks win it! The 2011 Dodgers were a mess. Well, sort of. This team missed out on the postseason for the second straight year, but they also nearly produced an MVP and a Cy Young winner from the same team. Center fielder Matt Kemp narrowly missed out on the MVP, while Clayton Kershaw won the Cy Young at just 23 years old. Nonetheless, these two, along with Andre Ethier and James Loney, formed an intriguing core to build around. Well, this is where the mess comes in. On June 27, 2011, the Dodgers filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy, a type of bankruptcy where the primary purpose is for a business to reorganize its debt in order to pay it off. Eventually, the team's total debt was revealed. $573 million. Among the list of top 40 creditors the team owed money to, many active and former players were named, including Manny Ramirez and Andrew Jones, who each had claims in the eight-figure range. So how did one of baseball's most historic franchises land in such a precarious position? Well, a couple years prior, Dodgers owner Frank McCourt and his wife Jamie McCourt, the team CEO, had filed for divorce. The subsequent court proceedings revealed the true extent of this family's expenditures. As summarized by Molly Knight in her book The Best Team Money Can Buy, while the Dodgers were slashing spending, McCourt and his family spent extravagantly on nine multi-million dollar homes, a private jet on permanent standby, and daily home salon sessions. Now, it's not like the Dodgers had slashed payroll to dire levels, but McCourt was blatantly abusing his position for personal gain. With McCourt's debt mounting up and fans begging him to sell the team, the writing was on the wall for his departure. Then, he had an idea. Back in 2001, the Dodgers signed a TV deal with Fox, but this was a time before the value of TV rights exploded. Initially, the Dodgers received around $15 million per year, but by 2013, the final year of this deal, the Dodgers were set to receive $38.8 million. This number was nowhere near what comparable teams like the Yankees, Mets, and Red Sox were receiving. So, given the size of the LA market, the Dodgers had the opportunity to double or even triple their annual return once the deal expired in 2013. However, McCourt had the bright idea to negotiate a new TV deal two years in advance for the immediate financial benefits. So, he went to Commissioner Bud Selig and sought approval for an offer from Fox, a 17-year, $3 billion deal though MLB executives valued the deal closer to $1.7 billion. Still a huge annual return, but what led Selig to reject the deal was his belief the deal prioritized McCourt's short-term personal needs over the team's long-term future. Evidence of this accusation included an upfront $385 million payment McCourt was set to receive at signing, and then used towards his personal debts. In the end, McCourt sold the team to the Guggenheim Group in 2012 for $2.15 billion, a number that doubled even the most optimistic prediction. Clearly, the new ownership group was riding on the enormous potential of their upcoming TV deal. Well, to say this potential was realized is an understatement.
In 2013, the Dodgers finalized a 25-year, $8.35 billion deal with Time Warner Cable for the team's TV rights. To put it simply, a hefty portion of this team's foundation relies on this TV deal. Not only does no team come close to matching this deal's yearly revenue stream, many people consider this deal the most team-friendly in baseball as the Dodgers are guaranteed their money in spite of the upward trend in cord cutting. This is in stark contrast to the 14 teams whose TV revenue is currently or will be affected by the collapse of Diamond Sports Group, a revenue source that accounts for about 20% of a team's total annual revenue. Now, both player agents and the players union can test the severity of the effects this lost revenue should have on team expenses, and there's no doubt many team owners could be doing more to alleviate the issues. Still, at least in the short term, the gap between large and small market teams has widened a bit, and the Dodgers are the premier benefactors. Okay, so now we understand some of the financial advantages the Dodgers possess, but simply spending money on star players doesn't guarantee success. I would know. I'm a Padres fan. Although, these team situations are not the same. Before this offseason, the Dodgers have rarely offered long-term deals to star free agents. Still, since 2013, not only have the Dodgers continuously ranked among the league's highest spenders, they have yet to miss the playoffs. In short, apart from the occasional pricey contract extension, the Dodgers operate with some financial restraint in order to avoid the inherent risks of long-term deals. This philosophy stems from team president of baseball operations, Andrew Friedman, but it's all in the name of a more grand idea. Typically, teams rebuild with the hope of creating a multi-year championship window, a window that eventually comes to a close. However, Friedman is challenging this notion. Instead of a team that's built to peak, Friedman wants a team that sustains high-level performance on a permanent basis. Call it the doctrine of sustained success, as coined by LA Times writer Jack Harris. Now, I imagine every team's GM or president of baseball operations dreams of sustained success, but either they're not given the financial resources from team ownership, or they fail to operate in the same manner as the Dodgers. What do I mean by this? Well, well, take a look at this leaderboard. These are the Dodgers' top 10 leaders in war between 2013 and 2023. Of these 10 players, seven of them were either drafted by the Dodgers or were released by their original organizations. Plus, this doesn't even take into account the overlooked veterans this team creates value from, such as JD Martinez, Jason Hayward, and Tyler Anderson. Clearly, the Dodgers have a system that works. But how does it work? Well, since the hiring of Andrew Friedman in October 2014, the Dodgers have focused on internal player development with improvements to nutrition, adding more coaches throughout the organization, and possessing enough statistical and biomechanical analysts to fill a big league roster. As for what the Dodgers look for during the scouting process, specifically for hitters, the team follows an old scouting mantra, power comes last. The Dodgers look for athletic, versatile players who have great bat-to-ball skills and strong plate discipline as they believe power can be added to a player's game if they already possess those two skills. For example, when playing in the Oakland A's organization, Max Muncy didn't showcase much home run power apart from his 2013 season. Then he joined the Dodgers and became one of the league's premier power hitters. Catcher Will Smith followed a similar path. In college, he hit for average and got on base, but after he was drafted by the Dodgers, he transformed into an elite offensive catcher with power. Overall, the Dodgers understand the types of players they want and they possess the technology to develop them into big league contributors. But as time goes on, the technological gap between the Dodgers and other teams is only going to shrink. How will they keep their edge on the competition? Well, team GM Brandon Gomes believes their ultimate separator is organizational cohesion. Providing an effective learning environment throughout an entire organization is just as important as the technology itself. A learning environment where, according to Friedman, there's respectful pushback and a constant burning desire to improve. As former Dodger Justin Turner describes it, this has culminated in an organization that doesn't follow cookie cutter strict programs. Everything is individualized and attention to detail is second to none. 
This approach has especially helped spike the success rate of drafted pitchers such as Walker Buehler, Tony Gonsolin, Dustin May, and most recently, Bobby Miller and Ryan Pepio, with the latter being the main player traded for Tyler Glasnow. However, Pepio is far from the only former top 100 prospect to be traded by the Dodgers. The midseason deals for Trey Turner, Max Scherzer, Manny Machado, and Yu Darvish all contained at least one top 100 prospect, and the Dodgers elected to re-sign none of these players, but this hasn't hurt them in the slightest. Since 2015, in all but one season, the Dodgers have maintained a top 10 farm system. Overall, the Dodgers have built a system that allows them to not feel the need to dive into the world of risky long-term contracts in order to maintain their goal of sustained success. However, that's not to say they've never dived into that world. Since acquiring Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman, they've done nothing but produce MVP-level numbers. However, the Dodgers aren't feeling the full impact of their contracts right now. At least 30% of the money in both of these deals is deferred until the 2040s. These deferments lower the average annual value of each deal, which is the number used in team payrolls that determine whether a team needs to pay the luxury tax. This is a tax teams pay if their payroll surpasses a predetermined threshold, which was $233 million in 2023. Since 2013, the Dodgers have paid this tax seven times. So while it's not a huge deterrent for them, it is something they keep in mind, as the more frequently they surpass the threshold, the more they pay. Now, the Dodgers did end the 2023 season over the luxury tax limit, but once this offseason began and players filed for free agency, only Betts and Freeman had guaranteed contracts after the 2025 season. This is because last offseason, the team exclusively signed players to one-year deals and elected to not re-sign departing veterans such as Trey Turner. Many reasons factored into these decisions, including a desire to stay under the luxury tax threshold and wanting to replace expensive veterans with cheaper, homegrown players. However, I have to imagine there was another reason to prepare for the pursuit of a player the Dodgers have scouted since high school. A player who's not only the best in the world, but could lead the Dodgers to a dynasty. What are your thoughts on Shohei Otani? Yeah, heard of him? He's, a, he's a pretty good player. Uh, I wish I could do that, but there's only one Shohei. They're chanting, come to Seattle. Do you guys want to start your own chant? That would be tampering. That would be tampering. <laughs> you can't do that. I'm not do doing that. any of that. But if he wants to come, yeah. he's more than welcome. The 2-2. Shohei Otani signing with the Dodgers wasn't entirely surprising, unless you were a believer in the Blue Jays' airplane theory. Although, if you told me over $680 million of Otani's $700 million contract would be deferred until 2043, I'd say the airplane theory was more believable. Without these deferrals, this contract would have an AAV of $70 million, by far the largest in MLB history. However, because the AAV of deferrals is calculated using its present day value, Otani's contract is actually worth $460 million in today's money, which creates an AAV of $46 million. Still a record-breaking contract, but a much lighter strain on the Dodgers' payroll. Of course, when the details came out, the big question on everyone's mind concerned the legality of this deal. Well, the CBA explicitly states that there are no limitations to deferred compensation. Okay, but then there's the question of why Otani would agree to such a radical contract. Interestingly, it was his idea. Not only does the lowered AAV give the team more room to sign better players, Otani already receives the majority of his annual earnings from endorsements, an amount no MLB player comes close to matching. 
which is a huge reason why he can quote unquote afford to defer 97% of his contract, as opposed to Betts and Freeman who deferred around 30% of their respective deals. Also, beginning in 2026, the Dodgers have to begin placing 44 million of Otani's $46 million AAV into an escrow account every year to grow over time until the $68 million annual payments begin a decade from now. So here's the overall summary. Otani will eventually receive his $700 million, and the Dodgers have entered a mutually beneficial agreement with baseball's best player. A player with enormous potential, not just on the field, but off the field as well, due to his immense popularity, particularly from the Japanese audience. Now, to make things clear, the Dodgers don't gain a financial advantage due to online merchandise sales or international TV rights because that revenue is split evenly among all 30 teams. The real advantage comes from Japanese companies that are begging to spend their advertising budgets on the Dodgers. Whether it's through jersey patches, stadium naming rights, or advertisements around the stadium. Which is why Angel Stadium advertised numerous Japanese companies through Otani's tenure. All in all, with this move alone, the Dodgers have placed themselves in a very exciting spot for the future. But then they did what Otani's contract was designed to do bring in more players. About a week after the Otani signing, the Dodgers traded for and signed starter Tyler Glasnow, creating an even more promising rotation. But there's still quite a bit of risk here. Throughout his big league career, Glasnow has always showcased elite stuff, but he's never surpassed 120 innings pitched in a season. Plus, with Otani not cleared to pitch until 2025 due to elbow surgery, along with the multiple other injuries in the Dodgers rotation, the foundation of this rotation was still a bit shaky. The Dodgers needed a true ace, someone who could pair with Otani at the top of the rotation for 2025 and beyond. Well, why not sign one of his teammates from Team Japan? On December 21st, the Dodgers signed NPB superstar Yoshinobu Yamamoto to the largest guaranteed contract ever given to a pitcher, a 12-year, $325 million contract. A risky but deserving contract for a potential ace who's only 25 years old. In the final three seasons of his seven-year NPB career, Yamamoto won the Pacific League MVP, the Sawamura Award, and the Pitching Triple Crown in all three seasons. To briefly describe Yamamoto, I'll use the words of a National League special assistant with extensive scouting knowledge in the Pacific Rim. No injuries, super durable, good delivery, fast arm. The sky's the limit on this guy. Really, the sky's the limit not just for Yamamoto, but for the Dodgers as well. Although many unanswered questions make the prospect of a Dodgers dynasty far from a guarantee. How will Otani pitch following his surgery? How will Otani's game age into his 30s? Can Tyler Glasnow actually pitch a full season? How long will Yamamoto take to adjust to the MLB environment? Will the Dodgers player development team continue to maintain their top-rated farm system? And perhaps the most important of all, will the Dodgers actually win when it matters most? As you've likely noticed, the modern era of playoff baseball has brought more volatility than ever. In the past five seasons, the Dodgers have recorded a 100-win record four times, and they failed to reach the World Series in all of these seasons. The only non-100-win season was 2020, when the Dodgers actually won the World Series. Also, despite this championship win, during his introductory press conference, Otani mentioned a meeting he had with the Dodgers' ownership group saying how the team viewed the past 10 years of consistent playoff baseball with only one championship to show for it as a failure. Simply put, this team wants to do more than just win. As Andrew Friedman once put it, he wants fans to look back at this period of Dodger baseball as a golden era. For the foreseeable future, the Dodgers are going to continuously remain as the favorites to win the World Series. Ultimately, what holds me back from definitively projecting a dynasty is knowing how unpredictable baseball is at its core. But if everything goes their way, and that's a big if, we could be witnessing the birth of a generational dynasty. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Leave a like if you did, and subscribe for more content just like this. Happy New Year! And thanks for watching.